Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Wahdahu la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I hope all of you and your families are doing fine and blessed with all kinds of blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this favor that he has bestowed upon us to enable us to participate in this program. And we ask his guidance to say the right way and the right thing in the right way. And we ask his protection from shaitan and we ask him to make this event for all of us a good deed in our records, inshallah, and accept it from us. With that dua, we'll start, inshallah, as it was mentioned. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, about six, seven verses, uh, verse 30 to 36 in Surah Fusilat or Surah Hamim Sajda. Both names are used for this Surah. And this is Surah number 41 in the order of Surahs. Uh, it's a Makki Surah and the basis of, and uh, focuses on uh, belief and strengthening our beliefs. But there are very beautiful uh, verses and beautiful points and concepts made in these uh, ayat that we all need to reflect. And even if we already know it, we need to refresh, inshallah, ourselves and strengthen our Iman. Uh, the first verse, verse number 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا Indeed, those people who said that our Rabb is Allah, the word Rabb, we'll use it right now in Arabic and keep it and inshallah talk about the meanings. Those people who say that our Rabb is Allah, and then they remained steadfast, then they stuck to this commitment, uh, uh, and they kept themselves straight and uh, uh, steadfast on this path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these people talk about different kinds of benefits that they will receive in this world and in next world. So which kind of people? The people who say that uh, Allah is our Rabb. Let's uh, talk a little bit about this part of the verse, the phrase, before we continue the verse. Allah says that those people who say Allah is our Rabb. What is the word Rabb? Rabb is a very beautiful word and a very comprehensive word in Arabic language in the Quranic terminology. Rabb can be translated in many, many different words in English. For example, we can say Rabb means provider, Rabb means Lord, Rabb means cherisher, Rabb means sustainer, Rabb means uh, owner, Rabb means ruler, Rabb means uh, sovereign, Rabb means caretaker. Many, many different similar words, all of them are the translations, correct translations of Rab. But if we have to uh, summarize those meanings, we could summarize them into three meanings that Rab means uh, Lord or uh, basically sovereign or ruler. And second, it's provider. And third, it is uh, owner. Uh, so this is a very powerful uh, meaning uh, to accept Allah as Rab. Because accepting Allah as creator, you know, this was uh, not difficult for Arabs of the time of the Prophet Wasallam, And even these days, most of the people, they believe in Allah as the creator, as the creator of this universe. But uh, if you ask them to accept Allah as their Rabb, then it, they have difficulty. Uh, a lot of people fail to do that. Or even if they say it, they would say it once, but then they will uh, forget that or they will become loose and gradually they will not uh, act as if Allah is their Rabb. Because a Rabb, you know, is someone that who rules your life. A Rabb is someone who rules the, this universe. 
Rabbul Alameen, you know, uh, Rabb of the entire universe. And Rabb, uh, Rabbul Mashriq wal Maghrib, Allah says he is the Lord and the Rabb of the East and the West. He is Rabbukum wa Rabbu Aba'ikum. He is the Rabb of you and your fathers and grandfathers and all of them. So he is the Rabb, he is the ruler that rules the universe and rules our lives in the sense that all of our body works based on his orders, our hearts, our lungs, everything works based on the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he is the rule inside us, he is the rule around us and in the universe. And the second meaning, provider. So Allah is the provider, he is providing all kinds of provisionings for us, the air to breathe, the food to eat, and the, all the sustenance, and everything else, all the other resources that we have, he is the one who has given us and he has also given us the capabilities and uh, all kinds of other things around us and inside us. So that's the provider. And then the third meaning that he is the owner, meaning that he owns our life, he owns our uh, possessions, he owns all the resources around us and he owns the entire universe. So he is a rub of all of it. And whether we accept Allah as a Rabb or not, he is a Rabb. But to believe in this truth, to believe in this fact, then changes people's lives. Because then they will not treat just Allah as a creator, but also a ruler in their lives. They will try to obey the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they will try to uh, you know, understand that everything that I have is actually possessed by Allah owned by Allah, I'm just a trustee of it and everything will be returned back to Allah. And if they understand that Allah is the provider, then they know that, you know, whatever uh, income, whatever provisionings in life that I have, Allah is the one who provides and Allah is the one who has given me. It is not my efforts only that has brought everything. My efforts were just a means and a lot of people make efforts, but Allah you know, gives to some people and doesn't give to some people or give more to some people and give less to other people. So Allah decides what to give and how much to give. So all the provisionings are Allah's. When, when we understand at least these three concepts of Rab, then the lifestyle of a person will change. Then, you know, you will no longer live without, uh, you know, acting properly, without reacting properly, without behaving in proper ways towards Allah. And basically we would live a very responsible life on this earth when we accept Allah as our Lord. But now the Prophet Sallallahu said that there are a lot of people who say that Allah is our Rabb and then eventually they lose the way or they become misguided or they become disbelievers. So that's why Allah said, Thumma staqamu. And those people who said so, who gave such a commitment to Allah, and then they remain the steadfast. Then they really stick to their commit, commitment that I have said so, and I believe so, and I will live based on these uh, slogans that I have uh, believed in, and based on these tenets that Allah is my Rabb. So then, uh, you know, a person makes every decisions based on that fact, based on that reality that my owner uh, is someone else, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my provider and my ruler and the ruler of the universe. You know, then uh, every aspect of our lives will change and we would act differently when we uh, when we uh, try to step, be steadfast and not to, you know, become loose or, or get back to our wrong ways uh, of life. Uh, a lot of things uh, change. Now, Allah talks about the benefits of such a commitment uh, in the remainings, uh, remaining of this verse and many other verses and other places of Quran. In this verse here says, تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَلَا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا That on these people who make such a commitment, the angels would descend on them. The angels would descend on them from the heaven. Allah will send the angels. The angels will come to them and the angels will tell them that, hey, don't have any kind of fear and don't have any kind of sadness. Don't have any kind of fear and don't have any kind of sadness. 
Subhanallah, can we imagine life without sadness and fear? How beautiful life becomes. You know, fear usually comes as a result of concerns and worries, usually about future. And what if this happens to me? What if my job is lost? What if my income is lost? What if my bank account uh, is gone? What if my car is burned? What if my house? What if my something happens to my children, to my family, to my spouse? What if, what if, what if? You know, a lot of concerns, worries all the time come to us. And when you say, Allah is my Rabb, SubhanAllah, now all of this fear can go away if you really reflect on the meaning of Rabb that Allah is the owner, so he took it back, he had given you, he took it back. Uh, and what is the big deal here if you really believe that Allah is the owner of everything that you had? And Allah is the provider, so he will provide something else. And instead, if he has taken something, he will give you back something. And according to Allah's laws and rules, this has to happen and he will, uh, you know, do many other things for us. So when you when we just reflect on it, it is enough to take the fear away from us. And also sadness. Sadness is usually related to the past. You know, when we think of some bad events in our life that has happened, we have lost some family members. When we think about them, when we certain situations that people embarrassed us, certain situations that we really you know, God offended and many other things happened to us. If we, the moment we remember those events, all of a sudden some sadness takes over. And now uh, when we think about uh, again, that who is Allah, Allah is my Rabb, you know, that sadness can go away. For example, if say my father is dead, my mother is dead, my spouse is dead, well, he's with Allah, with my Rabb, he's with my caretaker and he's, he's gonna take care of him as long as, uh, this family member or anybody else who has tried to live a righteous life. So uh, he is in much better position than he used to be in this world. Any other sadness that anything we have lost, anything that has happened, when we reflect and uh, through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the fear and sadness can go away by just thinking about the meaning of Rab. But beyond that, Allah says that he sends angels because sometimes we cannot uh, take the fear away no matter how much we think about Allah's meaning and the Rabb's meaning we would uh, you know not be able to overcome some sadness and fear so Allah takes another measure that he sends the angels the angels will come of course we don't see the angels but all of a sudden sometimes you have you might have noticed that while we are very much uh, sad while we are full of fear and full of anxiety full of depression all of a sudden we start feeling positively all of a sudden we start thinking of the positive side of the problem all of a sudden we start uh, reflecting that oh this can actually benefit me in some way you know not only the uh, sadness go away and the fear goes away but the beautiful you know, a state of happiness comes to us. But all of a sudden, peace comes to us. All of a sudden, we start feeling very, very good. You know, and, and just a few minutes ago, we were in such a bad, miserable condition, but all of a sudden, something came to our mind or to our heart, and actually, that's the angels. The angels came and told us, don't have fear, don't have sadness, we don't see the angels but that is, is sadness basically is taken away and the fear is taken away. So angels give this. So this happens in many situations in this life and it happens in the time of dying. When we die uh, in the moment of death, usually we have a lot of fear, you know, no matter how good of a Muslim we have been, sometimes, you know, we should really be concerned about that Maybe my good deeds were not, uh, would not be accepted by Allah. Maybe I did not do good enough. Maybe some of my sins have not been forgiven by Allah. So these kind of fears should be there with a believer, even in the moment of death, no matter how good of a Muslim the person has been. Or sometimes a lot of sadness in the moment of death will be with us that, oh, what happens to my spouse, to my children, to other things that I had. You know, so all of this sadness and fear, the angel will say, no sadness, no fear. And the Prophet Sallallahu said that the angel would come and take the soul of a, you know, Ruha Tayyib, uh, uh, Jasad Tayyib, that from the a good body, the good soul will be taken and the angels will say, oh, good soul, come out of the good body 
and uh, the angel would give the glad tidings and the good news in the time of death that any kind of sadness and fear can be overcome in, in the moment of death. This also happens when we get out of our graves, when we are resurrected in the day of judgment, uh, then uh, angels will give us this kind of good news and glad tidings that basically your accountability will become easier and inshallah uh, you will uh, uh, make it and so some those kind of thoughts and feelings will be given to us by the angels while everybody else is so worried and so terrified uh, when they get up from their graves uh, you know not knowing what to expect but a true believer would have a different kind of level so these things happen to anybody at all times uh, and especially uh, sorry in, in, in these three situations for believers uh, can happen in, in during this life in different moments and situations in the moment of death and in the moment of coming out of the graves uh, and then uh, not only that but the angels uh, give us additional glad tidings it says nahnu alla takhafu wa la tahzanu wa abshiru bil jannati allati kuntum tu'adun the angels will give the glad tidings and say that you know uh, 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 that now the jannah is uh, for you and and a good news that you will have the Jannah, so you, they will give the uh, good tidings and the uh, good news in the moment of death and in the time when we come out of the graves, uh, that the Jannah that was promised to you, you will get it, that, that Allah had promised to his righteous servants, you will get it. And beyond that, the angels will say, نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ They will say that, hey, we were your guardians in during this life, during the life of this world, we were your guardians. From time to time, Allah sent us and we came to you and we took away your fear, your sadness, and we were guarding you in many situations from other harms and evils. And now in the next world, we are your guardians. We will be with you, serving you, helping you, taking you to Jannah uh, by the uh, order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so uh, all these great, great, companionship of the angels will continue but in the next world we will be able to see the angels while in this world we could not see them but believe in them uh, so they will give this uh, glad tidings that we, now we are your guardians we will be with you your wali your friend and then the angels will also say that hey you're going to a place to the jannah in which whatever you want, whatever you desire, whatever you wish, you will get it. Whatever your soul wants, whatever you are, you know, your yourself wants, you get it. So there's no limit. You just wish, Allah will make it available for you. But we, our wishes, by the way, will be very positive wishes. So in the next world, those people who go to Jannah, they will not uh, make any kind of bad wishes like in this world, bad desires, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that before putting people in Jannah, is when azana ma fi suduri min ghil, that we uh, remove the uh, any wickedness from the souls of people before they go to Jannah. So, you know, people will be like angels in the Jannah, uh, like they will be only doing good and wishing good for each other and wishing good for themselves. So. Uh, you will always make good wishes and right wishes which are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah says you will get it in this verse uh, that angels will give this glad tiding that you will get that uh, whatever whatever you wish and whatever you want whatever you want and whatever you wish so both of them you will receive and uh, can you imagine that kind of life that for, you will receive whatever you want and uh, any kind of foods, drinks, uh, enjoyments, entertainments, uh, anything that you name it, you know, uh, uh, any means, any transportation, any uh, uh, happiness in, in the highest level and pleasure in the highest level, anything you just want, you get it. And the angels will say, that Nuzulam min Ghafoori Rahim and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announces also that all of this would be uh, hospitality, entertainment from the one who is very forgiving and very merciful. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has forgiven your sins because we all did sins and Allah was the one who forgave your sins. Otherwise you would not make it to Jannah. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been merciful to you. He has been multiplying your good deeds by 10 and uh, he has uh, acted in every way mercifully to you and your life uh, and uh, provided for you with all kinds of support and all kinds of sustenance and means so that you can succeed. So uh, now Allah is your host. Allah is providing hospitality for you and uh, you will live forever with this kind of happiness and enjoyment that if we just reflect on it and understand a little bit of it, then we would do whatever is required in this world so that Allah will be pleased with us. Because, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he explains all these all these rewards, all these compensation that Allah will give us, it's much more than what we deserve. It's much more than we can imagine. And it's much more than we have really done anything in this world for it. You know, uh, if you really re compare what we get in the next world to what we are doing in this world, this world, our efforts is nothing. You know, even if we are worshiping Allah 24 hours and if we do all the good deeds uh, all the time, you know, it's nothing compared to what we would get there. So um, this is really a motivation for anybody who reflects about Allah uh, and about who is Allah, that Allah is our Rabb and Allah is the one who has given everything and will take away. And eventually we will be in front of him accountable for everything. And uh, then why I should care about somebody else uh, and why I should not give the highest priority to Allah's pleasure why I should not live based on the rulings of Allah, why I should allow my low desires to take over me over, and why I should allow other people to insinuate me the wrong thoughts and go to the wrong paths, and why I should become loose, you know, so I, I better stick to this path that I have said Allah is my Rabb, and I want to really commit myself to this path, and that's really the path of success. There's much more to talk about these verses, but because of time, I have to keep going to the remaining few verses uh, that are also very loaded. But uh, because of time, uh, we have to be uh, brief. Then Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Muslimin. Allah says that who is better, who can be better in speech, than the person who calls people towards Allah. And the person who is righteous himself and the person who says, I am one of the Muslims. So Allah says, who is better in his speech than the person who has the following qualities? First, that they have, uh, they call people towards Allah. They invite people towards Allah. They are active in the path of Allah. They want all these great things that they have in their life in terms of support of Allah, peace and happiness and hope and courage and all of this. They want others also to have that. And they are active and they are day and night running for other people and uh, to help other people benefit from all of this mercy of Allah and all of this additional support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they call people towards the truth. They call people towards their creator, their uh, caretaker. And what a great call, what a beautiful call, what a beneficial call for others. That's the first quality. Second, that they are doing righteous deeds themselves. They are righteous. They are not just claiming and, and preaching, but they themselves act upon what they are teaching and sharing with others, number two. And number three, they are saying, I am a Muslim. They are not those apologetic people who hide their identity, who hide themselves. They come forward and say, I am a believer. I am a Muslim. I am standing for the truth. I want to share the truth with you also. And they go with, with courage and offer their daily prayers in front of others if they have to. They don't have other, other places. They you know, share their identity with others that I am a Muslim and I stand for these universal values that uh, God of the universe has, has given me. They are really proud of who they are in the positive meaning of pride. And they are really, uh, uh, you know, coming forward with all kinds of sacrifices 
to stick in the path and say, I am a Muslim, I am a person who have submitted to Allah and stand for justice, stand for peace, stand for truth. That's who I am. So these three qualities, if you have these three qualities and we better have all of us and we should all try to have, Allah says, who is better than this person? Who has these kind of, basically you are the best. You are the best from Allah's point of view. And we all want to be inshallah that, that, that kind of best person. And then after this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the interactions and the problems and issues that we may face as a result of being in this path. Allah first says a very big formula and principle that wala tastawil hasanatu wala sayyia that uh, evil and goodness cannot be the same. They are not the same. They are not equal. Evil is one thing. Goodness is another thing. It's obvious to everybody. But Allah also explains that what are the consequences of evil and what are the consequences of uh, goodness and how they are two separate kind of paths and two two separate worlds, basically. And then Allah says, idfa' billati hiya ahsan. Repel, return the bad with good. Now, this is taking us to a different level, that people are doing wrong to us, people are offending us, people are you know, attacking us, people are uh, hurting us, insulting us, but in return, Allah asks us, to re return with what? With good. Forgive them. Be kind to them. Show your generous character towards them. Be forgiving to, for their faults and their mistakes and their even vicious character. And go beyond that and even do a good to them. And, and, and this cannot uh, you know, happen unless you really have certain qualities that will come. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically tells us that if you do so, that this kind of attitude when you show to people who show uh, wrong, who do wrong things to you, this can convert your relationship and those people who have enmity with you, that enmity will be converted into a very good relationship and they will become your very close friends, very uh, uh, good people to you, you know. So, uh, because they will think about it, even though they show bad attitudes in front of you later on, they will sleep on it. They will think about it, and they will say that you know I was wrong, and he was patient. He could he could have responded with much uh, stronger words. He could have acted in very bad ways, but he did not, or she did not. And now I I better go and apologize. Most of the people will come back and apologize, and this is of course for personal relations. You know, uh, and this is not like for uh, standing for justice and others that, of course, in certain times you have to treat people justly and fairly. And justice requires that sometimes, you know, you return uh, uh, bad with bad and, and uh, good with good sometimes. But uh, that's at the level of usually groups and governments. But at the level of personal, at the personal level, we want to really be kind and forgiving as much as possible. And we want to excel and be excellent you know, in our character as, as much as possible. And that would really get them and inshallah overwhelm their heart and their mind and, and, and win their hearts and their minds. When they reflect on it, most of the people will regret their bad behavior. And then Allah says, وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا Not many people will reach this kind of level that uh, they can forgive and they can return the bad with good, except the people who who, uh, uh, pers uh, who uh, persevere patiently, who act patiently, who have this concept of sabr in the full meaning in their life. That sabr becomes jameel to them, sabr jameel, that sabr becomes beautiful to them. When they show sabr, they enjoy that act of sabr. They are not saying, oh, because of Allah, I'm showing sabr, I'm showing sabr. You know, no, sabr becomes beautiful to them. And, and when they do uh, uh, sabr because of Allah, they are, they are feeling so good because of that sabr. So Allah says, these are the people who show sabr in terms of controlling their anger, in terms of controlling their temptations, in terms of uh, you know not accepting any kind of offers that uh, uh, take us out of the straight path, uh, in terms of uh, you know all kinds of materialistic 
temptations that will take us from the right path uh, and in terms of uh, threats that people may give us you know that oh if you still become stay like this i will do this to you i will do that to you you know we'll have sabr patience and the steadfastness and we know that the end is with uh, the sabirun and the people who show sabr and allah will support and وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَزٍ عَظِيمٍ And Allah says, uh, only those people can show this kind of attitude to return bad with good when they have uh, a, 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 they are owning a full portion of, of blessings from Allah. You know, Allah has given them some special blessings and they are bestowed with those blessings and now they are really using those blessings in the right way. These are the people who can act like that and who can really return the path with good. And then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, gives us some reminders about the possibilities that, you know, no matter how good of a Muslim we are, no matter how righteous we are, no matter how much we can control ourselves in different situations and we try to return the bad with good, sometimes we're human beings, we can become weak and sometimes shaitan can get a hold of us and shaitan can incite us and all of a sudden we may say certain bad things or we may, we may be prompted to say some bad things. So Allah tells us if that happens, what should you do? وَإِمَّا يَنْزَغَنَّكَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ نَزْغُمْ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ That if shaitan comes to you and insinuates you and incites you with an incitement, with a whisper, all of a sudden shaitan comes and say, come on, revenge, you know, come on, say something uh, to him or to her, why you are quiet? Shaitan will come and say that, say something stronger, you know, do something. Shaitan will come and say that if you are quiet, that it will be interpreted as, as being coward, as being uh, fearful, as, as being passive, you know, do something, say something. Shaitan will come with all those kinds of, uh, you know, shaitanic logic to convince us to revenge or to do something wrong. If that happens, what should we do? Allah says, Fasta'il billah, refuge to Allah, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because indeed he is hearing, he can hear you and he can hear your soul, even if your soul turns to Allah, that's enough. Even if you don't say it in your mouth, Allah will hear it. And Allah also is alim, he has full knowledge of your situation, of your pain, of your hardships. And he has full knowledge of the, also those other people who are causing trouble for you, who are trying to act like a shaitan and an enemy you know, to you. So Allah has full knowledge of them and you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, with you basically. If you turn to him, that's enough. Shaitan will be defeated. Any kind of wrong temptations will go away. As soon as we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely and seriously, you know, so this is Allah's promise that, you know, because Allah knows that we are human beings, we can be overtaken by shaitan from time to time or by people who act like shaitan, you know, but what do you do? As soon as possible, even if something was happened that we said or we did, as soon as possible, we turn back towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask for forgiveness and we ask for support, for ask for help. And Allah will definitely help us momentarily. Allah will bring uh, peace to us, will bring uh, the feeling of apology to ask for forgiveness from others if we have done something or said something. And we would, uh, if we ask for forgiveness, not only we would not be, uh, you know, uh, coming lower, but we become higher. Allah will elevate us and Allah will put more respect in the high eyes of other people when we humble ourselves because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever shows humility and humbleness in front of Allah, and because of Allah, you forgive somebody else because you know that Allah is watching and Allah will reward you. Then Allah will elevate you and Allah will uh, put more respect and more dignity in the hearts of other people. There's, there are many more points about these verses, but I suffice uh, so that we can have time for some questions and answers. Uh, and uh, may Allah accept it from all of us and help us to benefit more from the remaining time. Inshallah, the first question um, on verse 31, uh, where we learned um, that the angels 
are our allies in this world as well as in the hereafter. Yes. Can you explain what it meant by the angels are our allies in this world? What are the different ways in which the angels help us in this world? Uh, how can we be more conscious about the presence and the help of the angels? For the question, yes. Uh, so uh, as Muslims, we know that uh, angels do exist and angels are uh, creatures that are invisible to humans' eyes. And angels, uh, there are different kinds of angels that are around us as a child, as guardians and other roles. But after we become adult at the age of uh, puberty, then two special angel angels will be descending from the heaven and will be assigned to every individual, as the Prophet ﷺ has explained. So these two angels will be with us, uh, monitoring us and recording our deeds, our good deeds and bad deeds, and they will be always with us. And then additional angels, uh, that they will be, you know, guarding us above us. So all these different angels that are with us and special angels that will come uh, uh, by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to provide some special and additional support for us. Now, as, uh, since we cannot see the angels, uh, we can easily forget this fact and we can easily overlook this fact, but it's extremely important that we continuously remind ourselves that angels are with us and angels are uh, monitoring us and recording us and guarding us also as long as we are trying to be on in uh, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the straight path. And now uh, these angels protect us in different ways. Sometimes angels protect us from harms and evils in ways that we cannot even imagine but by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes uh, they also, you know, uh, offer help to us. Uh, as this verse said that angels will, will bring this uh, hope to us and will, will, will bring this good news to us. Angels will take away the fear and the sadness from us. Angels will come and take away the depression, the anxiety by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are all, of course, actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but angels act as, as soldiers and as uh, uh, basically troops of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not uh, assistants of Allah. They are not helpers of Allah. We should know that Allah is free of any need of help or assistance. They play only the role of being soldiers. Only they act as Allah orders them. So they provide different kinds of support for us in different situations, depending on our circumstances, depending on our needs. And uh, they also accompany us uh, and as uh, when we really uh, remind ourselves that I have such creatures around me and they are always with me I'm never alone and I really have to remember uh, whatever I'm saying whatever I'm doing even though I'm alone in the room and there's nobody around me the angels are there and the angels are recording of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is seeing us but Allah has created a system in the world uh, so that we understand the work of Allah so angels uh, do the work of Allah in, the, in an understandable way for us that uh, you know, if we understand the role of angels, then we understand uh, the, the judgment in the next life that Allah has given them assignment to write the books and everything. And then those books will be put in front of us. So all of these things would be hard to understand unless we know the role of angels. Of course, Allah could do it without the angels, but Allah wanted to create this system a hierarchy so that he gives roles to different creatures and so that for human beings it becomes understandable the whole system of in this world and in the day of judgment uh, all the evidences will be in front of us that angels have recorded and angels would remind us that I was with you when you did the sin I was with you when you did this good deed you know and, and so uh, uh, yes uh, the role of angels are extremely important to remember and they provide different kinds of, uh, you know, support and help in different situations for us. Jazakallah, Karen. So when we reviewed these verses, um, they are verses that, inshallah, will help us to prepare for death because there is mention of the angels being there to provide us comfort during this very critical time. 
when we think about death, is it acceptable for a Muslim to be fearful of death? Uh, that is the reality of life. Allah says, Kullu nafsin maut. Every soul, every creature will taste the death. Human beings will die, angels will die, every creature will die. Now, uh, some fear from death is natural. Some kind, some level of uh, fear from death is natural. But if we understand what happens during death and what happens after death, then it will really minimize the fear from death. And in fact, uh, one could look forward to it if, if they really uh, uh, you know, embody this knowledge that Allah gives us in the Quran and Sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That really, uh, when we think about death, that death is basically not the end of life. Death is only a transition of life from one stage to another. Death is only the death of the physical body. The soul does not die. The soul is taken by the angel intact and uh, the soul keeps going. Just like during our sleep, our body is not functioning and our body is lying on the bed, but our soul travels and goes to different places and we have dreams and all that. So that's the kind of life that after death, basically the soul is active, but the body is dead. So when we understand these uh, uh, points about the soul being alive and death not being the end of life and understanding the uh, uh, what happens the aftermath of the death and also the fact that the time of death is predetermined and one of those things that would not change Allah has predecided and this and determined the the time of our death uh, so that will give us a lot of uh, you know positive feelings and assurance and the person would not be as fearful as those who do not believe in uh, next life, those who do not believe in uh, what happens during the death, uh, or do, uh, those who have weak faith and they are still too fearful of death. Uh, now, we must distinguish between fear of death and fear of accountability. Fear of accountability is a positive thing and we all should have it. The fear of muhasaba that Allah will do with us, that accountability. But fear of death can be overcome. Fear of accountability should always be with us. Uh, that, uh, that will drive us in a positive way and that will motivate us to do uh, more good deeds uh, the more we have that fear. But the fear of death uh, can be overcome by understanding and reflecting on some of the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah Karim. So we talked in these verses today about the importance of steadfastness in the deen and patience being a virtue that we need to try and implement in our lives. Uh, there's a specific question about how do you properly discipline children during instances where they're disrespectful to the parent while still upholding these values of patience and steadfastness? Very good. Uh, uh, sabr is really a great quality uh, of a Muslim. And sabr is, as the Prophet ﷺ said, is like a weapon of a Muslim. And sabr uh, really leads a Muslim to some great, great stages of life in this world and in the next world. And sabr really a quality and a, a, and a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that helps us uh, succeed in many goals of life. And sabr is something that keep us strong and sabr is something that helps us to really reflect on long term and understand the long term. You know, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls on us, Ya ayu alladheena amanu sabiru wa sabiru wa rabitu. Another place, Ya ayu alladheena amanu amanu sta'inu bi sabr wa salah. You know, uh, another place was ta'inu bis sabri wa salah. That uh, seek help from sabr. And all oh, believers show sabr and uh, basically compete with each other in sabr and with pe other people against you do competition. And uh, so uh, Allah calls on us to do sabr in many different ways because this is really a means of success. And this is really a means of moving forward. 
Uh, now, yes, Sabir has different kind of dimensions and different kind of applications, but in reference to your question about children uh, as parents, uh, first of all, we have to be show a lot of Sabir to our children in different situations, and this Sabir will really teach them a lot of lessons practically when we show Sabir. But beyond that, we need to explain to them the concept of Sabir. We need to explain to them the benefits of Sabir. We need to explain to them how to show cyber, how to do cyber. You know, simple examples, for example, uh, if, uh, if, a if we tell a child that, look, you know, I can give you, for example, uh, right now, say this $5, but if you wait until tomorrow, I'll give you $20. So now, which one is better? And of course, the children will say $20 is better. And so now uh, they can see the benefits of Sabr, that if I should do Sabr, now I get four times more or much more. So uh, this is a simple and simplistic example for children to understand the benefits of Sabr, that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains these concepts in many other ways for us, that as, as adults, as others, that if we really and practice sabr and show sabr, then uh, the reward is, you know, million times better than what we can imagine in immediately. Yes, sometimes, uh, you know, things become difficult and sabr is difficult, but turn to Allah and ask for sabr. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, when you ask for sabr, Allah will give you sabr. When asks for sabr, Allah will give them sabr. Uh, so, uh, in, in situations when there are hardships, but sabr is not just required for hardships, it requires many other things, like in the ibadah of Allah, in the ta'a of Allah, the obedience of Allah, worship of Allah, we need sabr. Uh, we need sabr even to achieve good things. Uh, so, to tell children that, you know, in order to, for example, go from one class to another class, you have to wait one year, one year in order to... Uh, to go to the next grade and in order to go to the from primary school to the middle school you have to wait for five six years and from middle school to high school you have to wait for two three years and to college the same thing so these concepts help the children to understand the concept of cyber and benefits of cyber and uh, and little things also when they show cyber for example kids want to ask a question and say hey be patient i'm busy right now ask me a few minutes later, or right now I'm talking to somebody, wait. And, uh, or uh, if the children ask for something that I want it right now, say right now it is not possible, you know, one hour later, uh, the next day, I'll give you. And you explain to them uh, uh, how beneficial it is for themselves to discipline themselves and to uh, uh, wait for that. So they can get it. They can get the ideas and they can emulate it and they can really practice it. Uh, inshallah, as long as we give them the, uh, uh, you know, uh, explain to them in the right ways, and we 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 sh show it ourselves. Uh, if we are not sober in the house uh, with our spouses, with our children, you know, the children cannot learn sabr, and they think sabr is just a as a theoretical thing, as not a practical thing, and so they will also show impatience. Uh, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows that this is a weakness of human beings that we are impatient, you know, inna linsana you know, that human beings are created in a state of anxiety and impatience. So this is, but we can overcome it by the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and help the children to understand how they can overcome their uh, anxiety and weaknesses by sabr. Will angels be with Muslims in paradise? And if so, what is their role there? Yes, uh, angels will be visible in the next world uh, and even in, at the moment of death, uh, angels become visible and then in the grave, angels uh, will visit and company, give company and then in the uh, day of judgment, uh, they will be uh, in front of people and in the hellfire and paradise, they will be there. They will do different tasks that Allah assigns them. So all kinds of services that are uh, provided in Jannah for the believers, you know, angels will provide those services. Uh, uh, all the things that have to be done in, in a hellfire, angels will do all those. 
So Allah will give them assignments all the time and they follow those assignments and different angels will be asked to do different things. Uh, so angels will be there and angels will be great companions because you see them that these angels live in this world as noble creatures that never did anything wrong. And in the next world, they always do the right things by obeying Allah, uh, you know, uh, unconditionally. Uh, and so, yes, angels will be visible and will be doing all kinds of things for the believers, all kinds of services, all kinds of, uh, you know, companionship, protection, and many things. Jazakallah. Inshallah, this will be the last question. In uh, verse I, I to talk, okay, so go ahead and then I'll talk about the concept of Rab a little more. Okay. So in verse 33, we learn the importance of inviting to the truth, inviting to the way of Allah. Can you say a few words about the virtues of doing dawah? Is it enough simply to be a good Muslim, read your five daily prayers, fast in the month of Ramadan, look after your family and, and lead your life with religion in a very personal manner? Or how important is it for Muslims to really take up this task of inviting to the way of Allah? Very good question, Mashallah. Uh, Yes, uh, da'wah, basically calling others towards the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a very, very important responsibility of Muslims. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to send prophets one after the other. Reformers, basically, the different uh, kinds of, uh, you know, uh, Rasul and uh, Nabi and uh, all kinds of prophets were coming. But Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam is the last and final prophet, as we know. And after him, there will be no prophet. So Muslims have the responsibility to do the, uh, that kind of task, to share the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with other people and continue this mission uh, until the day of judgment. Uh, 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 the importance of it is so much that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the short surah that we all have memorized as, as a child, the surah al-asr, that Allah took, takes an oath and says, uh, you know, with, Allah takes an oath with the time and it says, well, Asr inna l-insana lafi khusr illa ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. That Allah basically says that every human being will be a loser in the day of judgment, except the people who have four qualities, those who have a belief and a good deeds, and then emphasis on two good deeds, whether they inviting, uh, promoting the truth, and sharing the truth, and exhorting people towards the truth, and exhorting people towards sabr. So uh, Allah says that uh, every human being will be a loser in the day of judgment if they do not uh, promote the truth among each other and other people. And so it is a very important requirement of every Muslim that we cannot say that it's enough for me to be a good Muslim and it's enough for me to just uh, do certain uh, the things. And uh, no, I, if, if, it's, if it, the message is the message of truth that I have, and if I am enjoying this truth, and if I am really benefiting from the truth, then why I do not want this truth uh, to be shared with others? The Prophet Sallallahu told us that you know you, uh, you cannot be basically a Muslim if you do not want what you want for yourself for others. So we must uh, uh, share uh, the uh, truth with others, and we must help others understand. And especially that Allah has brought as here in this kind of society that we live in America and people around us are mostly non-Muslims and they don't know anything about the truth, about Islam, about the teachings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the Quran, then who, who would uh, uh, share with them if we don't share? So we all have this responsibility and this uh, you know, requirement that we must be active in different places, in our workplace, in our uh, uh, school, in our classes, in our uh, a family environment in our uh, gatherings that we get together in any place that we are of course we have to use wisdom and hikmah we have to understand say it in the proper way and in the right way but we have to feel responsible that i have to do something i have to share especially those people that we are dealing with on a daily basis they are our classmates they are our colleagues they are our close friends they are uh, you know uh, very close uh, neighbors how could we not share the truth with them how could we, this is an 
to them. This is an injustice to ourselves. So we must be active and we cannot be active alone. We should be joining different groups, people, different movements, different kind of you know communities. And we should join a masjid. We should join uh, others uh, in this path of dawah. And so there's a lot to talk about, but because of time, I have to you know uh, limit it. That dawah is a responsibility, and dawah has great benefits for ourselves because every time we call others, we have to reflect on ourselves and how much I'm practicing. And we don't have to become scholars to uh, do dawah. The Prophet وسلم, said that even if you know one verse of Quran, one word, go and share it. Uh, it uh, and don't wait until I become a scholar, then I'm going to uh, you know, uh, invite people because no matter we know we don't know anything and no matter how much we learn we still have a lot to learn so we should keep going and that actually is, itself is a path of education when we do dawah we will be prompted to learn we will be prompted to ask questions ourselves from others and so it's very beneficial for ourselves and it's beneficial for others and it is important and significant to do that so the starting uh, verse saying that Allah said that those people who say Allah is our Rabb. Uh, this is very important concept because especially if we reflect on the time of the Prophet you know people accepted Allah as creator. Uh, Arabs they all believe that Allah is the Khaliq uh, you know, the creator of the heavens and the earth but they had a hard time to accept Allah as the Rabb. So the the initial revelation that came the first five verses three times Allah repeated the word Rab. all the initial revelations uh, Surah Al-Duha Surah uh, Muzammil Mudathir if we see all of these verses and surahs one after the other they talk about the Rab because the, this word Rab uh, uh, Arabs needed to understand and accept Allah as their Rab uh, uh, and, and so for all of us it is so important to think and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained the importance of this also so much that one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, uh, his name was uh, Sufyan uh, Abdullah al thaqafi he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, teach me something that I can uh, follow and adhere to it and then I don't have to ask anybody else about it. That should be enough for me. The uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, uh, Rabbi thumma Rabbi Allahu thumma staqim. That say that my Rabb is Allah and then stay, stay, remain steadfast to it. So uh, basically the Prophet ﷺ also summarized the whole teachings of Islam that, that if you take Allah as your Rabb and then you remain steadfast to this, then that's the key of your success. Uh, so, uh, you know, if we reflect more, there's much more about this concept of uh, Allah being Rabb uh, but he is our Rabb, and let's remind ourselves that in our daily prayers, when we offer our Salat, we say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So we use the word Rabb uh, uh, right after Allah. We say Subhana Rabbi Al Azim, Subhana Rabbi Al Ala. So every time we use the word Rabb, let us remind ourselves. And one of the best translations of uh, Rabb is Caretaker, you know, the one who takes care of us in every kind of situation and provides for us. So uh, uh, the word Rab is used so many times in our Salat that we have to continuously from now on remind ourselves and relate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of times when we have difficulty, just say, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, Ya Rab. You know, that will change a lot of things. A lot of things uh, will be solved by just saying, Ya Rab, Ya Rab. The word has a very powerful effect on the heart and on the mind when we just use the word Rab instead of its translation and this word can really uh, change the world uh, and, and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduced himself after Allah he said Ana or, or, uh, uh, sorry that uh, when Musa alayhi salam uh, in the Mount Sinai Allah introduced himself said Qul innani ana Allah rabbul alameen another place Qul innani ana Allah ana, uh, ana, wa ana rabbuk uh, that Allah said I am Allah and I am your Rabb in Rabbul Alameen. In Surah Fatih also, as soon as Allah introduces himself, Rabbul Alameen. So this concept of Rabb is very important and significant to understand and reflect on. And inshallah, from now on, we use this word. And I have to stop because of time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help from all of, uh, except from all of us. 
and help us to reflect on these uh, humble uh, reminders. Jazakallah khair. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirak wa atubu alayk. Awudhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Wal asr. Inna l-insana lafi khus. Inna al-lazina amunu wa amilu s-salihat. Wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Sadaqallahu lazim. Allah.